Hello out there. This is Pamela Fagan Hutchins, and you have found me either via podcast or videocast, pick your poison, on Wine, Women, and Writing. This is the show where I talk with other writers, especially other writers of women or women who write about their authentic complex characters and what makes us love them, hopefully with a sprinkling of something wonderful, real life, or even scandalous behind the characters. We never know until we get there. And uh, it is a a fully copyrighted and owned production of Authors on the Air Radio Network. I always have to say that or I get in so much trouble. And I am excited today to have a guest who I've been reading for years. Welcome to the show, Mary Burton. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm great. It's great to be here. Well, I really appreciate it, um, most especially because I've already confessed to Mary that I'm like a chicken with my head cut off with a dog that's had surgery, and she's been very kind. <laughs> I've you. been there myself. I totally get it. I have three dachshunds, and they're all old, and one of them has had several back surgeries, so I get it. Thank you. I thank you. I'll have to get tips and advice on, um, not for him, but for me, how do I survive? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a trial. Oh my God. These animals grab our hearts, right? They do. Absolutely. So with respect to Mary's presence on the show today, while I love that she has dachshunds, I actually asked her on because of her new book, which is called Near You. And mm -hmm. you can probably tell it so much better than I can. Um, if you could give people a little bit of a teaser about Near You and what it's about. Okay, well, Near You kind of came out of a book I wrote last year called Burn You Twice, and it's about an arsonist. And there was a secondary character in that book who didn't get a lot of much airtime, but I was totally fascinated by her. Her name is Ann Bailey, and she's a forensic psychologist. And she's a single mom. Um, her husband has died from the in the last book. Um, and she has, um, she has got a, a man who is fairly obsessed with her and more fires begin and you start to wonder who's who is fascinated by Anne ish and then who who wants to um, just kind of take over her life but Anne kind of turns the tables on everybody and she is going after this arsonist um, she is contacted by the Monta Montana Highway Patrol and she's asked to consult on a case and she be she starts to see some similarities between this case and old ones, but she gets very involved in it. And as she kind of takes control of the case, she takes control of her life. And um, the the guy that's um, kind of her um, shadow um, is Elijah Weston, and he is a very charismatic guy who spent ten years in jail for arson. And he and Anne have kind of a a, a past, and that comes out in this book as well. There are a lot of, of layers of relationships in this book. Um, definitely the one with Elijah and Ant was very interesting and, and, and pivotal, but I loved the relationship with her and her son. They've been through such a difficult time. And this is the Pamela reaction to the book is I'm reading mm -hmm. her and I'm thinking tough woman who's had to protect her heart and she has to protect her, herself and her son. And there's so many walls that she could put up. But when it comes to that son, you just see the inside, the tender inside of her and how, how we can be so tough on the outside and yet there be something that absolutely terrifies us and something happening to him. Just absolutely. Absolutely. Goes. And of course, he kind of becomes threatened in this book because that is her soft spot and she will do anything for her son. And that's I think that's what finally she really starts to pull herself up even more. She's always been accomplished, but this is a time when she really has to be the major protector in her son's life. And, and she is willing to do what she needs to. So when you first started envisioning the book before this, where you started with The Arsonist, um, mm -hmm. a fascination with fire, um, did it just strike you as a really fun thing to write into a book? I mean, I like, I'll, I'm going to admit this. I like to light matches. I like to, mm -hmm. to you know, smell. I've always loved to burn things. So any of that going on that led <laughs> you to this book or um, just sounded like a good plot? Well, I was um, I go to um, the Writers Police Academy and it's um, it, it's virtual this year. But two years ago, it was in North Carolina, which is close to me. I'm in Virginia. 
And um, I, I love this conference. I've been going to it for 10 years and it's when law enforcement uh, members of law enforcement are kind of assembled to teach writers about the the, um, the techniques of law enforcement so that we can get it right in the book. And uh, one of the very first seminars I sat in at this conference was a case on, was an arson, he was an um, ATF investigator, retired. And um, he was talking about arson and he was talking about a couple of cases that had been, they'd already been adjudicated and settled so he could talk about them freely. But as he talked about them, he talked about a woman and her son and um, how they'd survived this fire. And I thought, wow, I think that that could just be the next novel. Um, and so and you never when I go to this conference, I never know what idea is going to hit me. And so but this one really struck me, struck me. And so I'm driving home. It's about a three hour drive and I'm thinking a lot about it. And I decide then that the next book it became Burn You Twice was going to come out of this conference. And um, I got lots of books on arson. Um, but, you know, if anybody saw my the books being delivered to me, might have been weary. But I uh, read a lot about it about arsonists, what makes them tick, um, complicated people, um, and I just finally decided that you know this this is such a rich uh, topic, not only forensically but psychologically. I, I wrote Burn You Twice, and then I carried it into Near You. Well, I really, really like Anne, and I like that in some ways she has been, well, she's been burned twice for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. Everybody has. Yeah. Everybody has. And that she pursued a field and career that arose out of her past instead of letting it cower her. And that really fascinated me. So she's been a victim but has mm -hmm. become someone who faces that head on as a way to deal with it. And I really loved that strength in her. It was fun to read. Yeah, she's just, you know, she keeps, she's always put one foot in front of the other. And regardless of who's told her no, or this isn't a good idea, she just kind of quietly keeps moving forward. And, um, and that's what she's done up until this point in the book when Quietly moving forward, she's going to have to kick it up a notch. But no, she is incredibly strong um, in a quiet sort of way. Um, but yeah, she is one of my favorite characters. There's a lot of other interesting female characters in this book. There are, I don't know if, you know if you want to call them a cult or groupies for this arsonist mm -hmm. in the book. Um, and where did where did these come from? Had you had this in the in the last book, or or where yes. did these fireflies come from? The, they were kind of mentioned in passing in the last book as part of Elijah's story that there yeah. were these women that wrote to him. And in fact, the heroine in um, Burn You Twice, she's now a, a detective and she almost died in the fire. She and Anne almost died in a fire that um, Elijah was sent to prison for. And so she is, she, this fire left an impression on her as well. And she has written um, Elijah over the years. She's not a firefly, but she's kept up with him. And um, so the fireflies were just kind of this kind of in the background kind of thing. And in this book, I thought, well, what if, you know, they become more of center stage in this book and Elijah is still there because he's, he's a complicated character and he could have another book. I mean, he's just, um, he's got his secrets and he's incredibly intelligent. Um, and I won't I won't say too much about him because it'll give burn you twice away. But um, he's been he's out of prison after ten years, and he's he has an agenda. Yeah, and and the, the the what was interesting to me about the fireflies as characters was that when you think about women that write to men in prison, and you're you know you're thinking what kind of women do that? What motivates them to do that? That you gave them all a reason, that they all had some kind of backstory, that while they might have been someone who you would never expect to become fascinated right. with an arsonist, that they all became real and not just some stereotype of, oh, this poor woman that writes to a prisoner. They weren't that. They were women that were either fascinated or repulsed or thought they could help, had all these complex reasons. And, and as a reader, that to me, I really loved seeing it done that way. That was fun for me to, to think about what makes them tick. I enjoy characters that um, almost their decisions 
kind of get them in their in their own trouble and they're not they can have a completely full and happy and productive life but they've got this little character flaw that can get them in trouble and uh, it always makes them interesting if they're multifaceted I think um, you know women who just for whatever reason and and Elijah's very charming and when he writes them back they get hooked because he is so clever and so intelligent he knows what buttons to push for everybody and um, so he, they, he kind of pulls them deeper into his world. He definitely has things about him that are so redeeming and things about him that are, are so uh, not just clever, but um, endearing almost. Yeah. yeah. Some of them very endearing, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so we'll have to make sure we, like you said, we don't spoil the last book, but also we don't, don't spoil this one um, with too much. So I'll dance around all the edges of these characters. <laughs> They're fascinating. I also, when, um, when I asked Mary to be on the show and I knew that this book was coming, I was super excited personally because it's these this series is set in Montana in the Mountain West. Mm -hmm. And um, those of you that listen and watch know as a Wyoming girl that that's very near and dear to my heart. So what drew you to Montana to write these characters? Well, it's, it's a gorgeous state. Um, but, but years ago when I first got my start um, writing, I was writing historicals and I set several books in Montana and cause I just, it's just, it's a character unto itself. Um, and I do try to find settings that can be as beautiful and dangerous. Um, it just, it creates an extra la layer of tension in the book. Um, and Montana just seemed perfect because there's that remoteness. You can't always get your cell service. You can be as dry as Tinder out there. Um, it's just, it's just like a perfect location for um, a book. <laughs> I loved how in the beginning, there's there's some really vivid scenes in the beginning with um, with an arsonist and with fire, and how explosive it was in that it was dry as a tinderbox. It was remote. Mm -hmm. If the fire got out of control, help for the land and the people around it wouldn't be coming anytime soon. If um, there was to be someone to save the person that was in danger, help wasn't near. And even to investigate it, that that's dangerous. When Anne mm -hmm. is is out walking the scene and looking for clues, you know, it's a she's by herself and it's remote and dangerous, and she gets herself it's into dangerous. trouble. Yeah, right, it's dangerous. I mean, it's it's a land that is unforgiving. Yeah. Beautiful, but if if you're not careful, you can really end up hurt. And as um, my uh, writer friend Danielle Girard and I like to say about Montana and Wyoming, it's they're also closed. Um, taking no more people that are moving to the states that we recommend North Dakota, South Dakota. I'm kidding. We always <laughs> let go. anytime we talk about them on the air, we start talking about how beautiful we are. But we're like, but wait, they're not taking any more people. So. That's right. That's enough. Oh, yeah. Nice. North Dakota's great. <laughs> so really beautiful. <laughs> uh, but I, I agree with you that that added this layer to the book. Um, there is a romantic interest that starts to develop um, uh, that Anne is very resistant to. And mm -hmm. even he is, he's law enforcement. He's a long way away. Even if he wants to help, he can't get to her unless he, um, her, travels a great distance or, or against her will just sticks around it's a little jet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so all of it s serves to isolate her and push her mm -hmm. into having to use her own devices. So if this is your kind of fiction out there, guys, where strong women find, well, women that are strong inside find reserves of strength that are beyond what they even expected they have and are forced to use their smarts and physically, be strong as well. You're really going to love this. Um, the arson, the fireflies, the Montana setting, all of that was pretty great for me as well. So you've mentioned that at least Elijah feels like he has another book in them. Do you think this setting and, and these characters um, for you will keep showing up? Uh, are you writing any of them now or uh, moving on to something else wonderful for us to look forward to? Uh I've moved on to something else. I'm going <laughs> to, I often will take a break from a couple of, you know, a couple of connected books. And the next book is called Don't Look Now. And it's out September 28th. And it's, it, it's Austin, Texas. Again, another kind of 
rugged, interesting city that has lots of different people in it from all different backgrounds. Um, and it, my heroine in the course of the investigation is injured and it's how she continues forward with her injury and solving the case. But again, another strong woman, pull herself by up by her bootstraps kind of gal. And um, cause I just find these ladies interesting. Um, so yeah, that's out in September. Is it related to any of your past books? Um, no, um, this new. one, it's new. Um, again, it's got a lot of characters that, you know, by the end of the book, I find myself going, well, what's going to happen to that person or that person? <laughs> so it, that's always a good sign when you finish a book and you feel that, you know, you kind of have a couple lingering questions. Uh, you know, the main story's wrapped up, but I love it when readers say, well, what about so-and-so? What about, you know, it's great. It's they're, they're, they're invested. Exactly. And you know, it's a good sign for you as a writer when you feel it happening to you and you're leaving the book and you're like, I think they're going to feel like this with me. And so we'll, that will be one that we can visit selfishly. Again, Austin is someplace I love. So, you know, bring I it to. <laughs> I do too. I love Austin. I haven't been there in a couple of years, but I've set several books there. It's a fantastic city. Well, and that's why I asked about whether it was related to Jenny in the past, having read some of your past Austin books there and enjoyed the characters, but it'll be even more fun to see it through new eyes. So do you travel, COVID notwithstanding, do you travel a lot um, to visit locations that either you enjoy and may write about or that you may write about and end up enjoying? Oh, I did pre-COVID. Um, I've, I've had to kind of rely on YouTube and, and Google Maps and a lot of research books this last year, but I, I, you know, you can learn a lot on the internet about a town. When I flew into Austin about four years ago to meet a friend and she lived there and she was going to give me the grand tour and she read one of my books and she goes, Mary, there's no way you can set, you can ditch a body on the side, side of I-35. It's just not possible. <laughs> and I said, I pulled up my notes and I said, exit 220, 238A, let's go there. And we go there and there's a vacant lot. And she goes, I never knew. I said, Google Maps, I'm telling you, you can learn a lot about a place. But you, yeah, you find yourself scouring the area looking, you know, can I work it, a scene in here, work a scene in there? And it works. It's it's more fun to visit, though. It's far more fun to visit. But I love to go where I'm writing a scene at that time of year and be able to look at it and imagine myself the character and smell it, you know, and listen to it. And that's with COVID for me, what's missing, you know, as a writer. It is. is you can't go immerse yourself in that place and be that character for just that, that brief time. I know. I'm hoping, 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 you know, that. In fact, my next book, I'm set locally in the Richmond area, so I can kind of get to it a little bit better and, and look around. Um, but um, yeah, I'm hoping all that shifts next year so we can get back out there because right. I, I really do miss the traveling. Yeah, me too. And, um, you know, I loved listening to you talk about the Police Writers Academy. I tried to get into the one two years ago and I waited too long and it was already full. So well, it's virtual this year. It's virtual. I'm going to I'm going to do it. Up. Yeah, I'm going to I'll be there um, because it's I've already looked at the uh, agenda and it looks fantastic. Uh, do you find yourself when you go, you mentioned getting an idea there. Do you find that that's a real spark for you when you attend conferences and things? Yeah, especially that one, especially I have probably walked away with six or seven book ideas that I ended up writing based on that conference, because when the guys start to talk about like, just a side about a, an everyday life or a case or something. It just, it gets you thinking. And um, it's, um, and, and of course it's, they know there's a room full of people just listening to everything. They're saying. <laughs> it's like, say more, please. Um, but yeah, it's just a, it's just a great way to, um, it's just a great way to learn about law enforcement and police procedure um, because once you, you know, if you can kind of understand the basics, then you can kind of carry it from book to book. You know, jurisdictions do change and you have to watch that. But I tell you, your readers will let you know if you if you if it's, if it's not right. 
Absolutely. They will. And God bless you guys for doing that. Cause we don't want to get it wrong either. <laughs> exactly. We don't, we don't want, and thank you for, and I always learn from my readers. So I appreciate that. Um, and, and I, it makes me better and sharper on the next book. Well, we're looking forward to the next book. And for you guys that did not, as instructed, go out and read this ahead of time so that you could book club with us today. It's near you. and It's the uh, follow up to burn you twice. Um, I think you guys are going to love it. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of my readers like these Mountain West um, type of uh, crime fiction books. So it's going to be right up your alley. And it was definitely right up mine. And thank you so much for your thank understanding you. today and for being on the oh, show. I've got three dogs sleeping around me right now with my fingers crossed that nobody rings the front doorbell. <laughs> you know, I should have just pushed one of those doorbell sounding things on our oh, show. Yeah. <laughs> just, just You will hear it. it. <laughs> it's like, <please>. I feel you. <laughs> well, all of you out there, thanks for tuning in. I'll see you next episode. And in the meantime, if you'd like to check out the next guests to remind yourself of past guests, see the shows, find out the books we read, it is Pamela Fagan Hutchins.com, Wine, Women, and Writing. Um, so, see you next time out there, guys. Bye, everybody, and Mary, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me.